From Anchored in Faith Gospel Church in Oxford, Iowa, this is Anchored in Faith. Last time, uh, we were talking, teaching on the doctrine of Christ, and the reason that uh, God gave me this is that uh, I'm convinced that there's a lot of churches and ministries that don't have the doctrine of Christ. They think they do, uh, but when you understand what the doctrine of Christ is, you may want to change some things, like who you support and who you listen to and who you watch and that type of thing. Uh, we said last time, I'm going to go through this a little quickly because I want to get on to my next point, but we said that the doctrine of Christ includes uh, six different areas. One is the deity. Jesus is God. We taught on that last time. Uh, Jesus is God. Uh, a second point is the virgin birth, which we will start on this time. The bodily resurrection of Jesus. Not everybody teaches that. Watchtower doesn't teach the bodily resurrection. Neither do the Mormons. They teach that Jesus had a spirit body, not a spiritual body, that he was a ghost, that it was a spirit that appeared to the, to the apostles. So that's not bodily resurrection. All right. Um, and then uh, the sinless life of Jesus and the vicarious atonement, which means once one man, one individual died in place of everybody else. That's what Jesus did. He died in our place. He was crucified for us. And then finally, the visible return of Jesus. Jesus is going to return and we're going to see him. In fact, everybody's going to see him, I think, because some will be joyful and some will not when they see him. There'll be a lot of wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth when Jesus appears. So he's going to return. He said he would, and he's going to put his feet on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to reign and rule. Now, again, not everybody teaches that. So with that review, um, we want to remind you what we taught last time about the deity of Christ. Jesus didn't deny that he was God. Uh, if you look at, I'll give you just one verse, I gave you some more last time, but in John um, 8, 56, 57 and 58, he's talking again to the Pharisees and the religious leaders he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews to him, thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple and passed through the midst of them, and so went his way. When he said in verse 58, before Abraham was, I am, he used the same word that God used to Moses at the burning bush. He said, who should I say has sent me? And he said, I am. Y-H-V-H, -H, Yahweh. There's no vowels in Hebrew. You have, I don't, not sure how everything's pronounced, but how you accent things and pronounce the, determines what the word means. But there's no vowels like we have, A-E-I-O-U, none of that in Hebrew. So he said, I am, that means Yahweh. That's the covenant name of God. Now the word Jehovah, is a made up name. The Pharisees made that up as a religious tradition. They felt that the name of God was too holy to speak. So they made up this word Jehovah. And that's a combination of Adonai 
and Yahweh and other names for God, but it's not the name God gave Moses when he sent him to Pharaoh. And it's not the name that Jesus used. When he used this name, the Jews got mad. You're saying you're the great I am? That's exactly what I'm saying. Before Abraham was, I am. And of course, Abraham was their father. Moses was their lawgiver. Nobody was greater than them, according to the Jews. But Jesus is saying that he is. So he never denied that he was God. At his trial, he didn't deny it. He said, he's on trial in front of the Pharisees, and it says, the high priest said in, this is John uh, 14, 16, I believe, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Look, why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. So, he's saying he's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the one that will appear. And of course, they wanted to kill him for it. So, when you and I in this world go out and tell people that Jesus is God, and we have God living in us, and Jesus expect to get stoned. Maybe not literally, but you know how people are. You know what they say. You're crazy. Yeah. Mark, Mark Twain said, all Christians are crazy. They're all insane. Mark Twain said that. Of course, Mark Twain used to go to seances and watch the tables tip and that kind of thing. But that's the reaction you're going to get. You say you've got God in you? <laughs> wow. Who are you? So, that's what we can expect. And the church is flying a false flag a lot of times. They say, oh, just get saved and you'll be all right. and It'll be all good. All good. Everything's all good. All good in the hood, you know. And you'll just sail on to heaven and you won't have any opposition and everybody will like you and you'll just be, uh, you know, it'll be great. That how it is? No, it's not. If you're trying to serve God and you're trying to especially tell people about what you've experienced and what's happened, you're going to get opposition. And as we come closer to the return of Christ, the opposition is going to get worse, worse and worse and worse. You already can't say anything in public practically anymore about Jesus, all these graduations, these kids are going to graduations and can't pray, can't say God, can't say anything about God, thank you, none of that. That's all changed since I, I'll bet every one of you when you graduated from high school, had a minister or priest or somebody that said a prayer and talked about God bless the class or something like that, we did. No more. You might offend somebody. But Jesus offended everybody. He went to the cross by himself. Nobody went with him. He was all alone. All his disciples, gone. Family, gone. Everybody. Only him and the Roman soldiers. So, that's what you can expect. Okay. Now, so Jesus never denied he was God, even though people try to say today, well, you know, he never really said he was God. I'm thinking of one big, big name evangelist that says that Jesus never said he was God. If I said his name, everybody here would know him. I'll get around, I'll say his name, I'll get around to it, but he's big. So, um, all right, let's move on to the second point, and that's the virgin birth. Now this is probably 
One of the things that really is the most controversial about Jesus is the fact that he was born of a virgin. Now, the reason for that is that, of course, we think of women having babies, we think of relations between a man and a woman, and the birds and the bees and all that. There was none of that. None of that. God simply created from nothing like he always does and put himself in Mary as a child. Now, one of the reasons that people will oppose this is because, well, let me give you the basic scripture. That's Isaiah 7.14. That's the Old Testament prophecy about him. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign a virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now, the word in Hebrew for virgin can mean a young woman or it can mean a young woman who's never known a man. Now, depending on which Bible you're reading and how it's translated, determines whether or not you have the doctrine. Because there are versions that say, instead of a virgin will conceive, a young woman. Well, that's pretty common. Women have babies all the time. Young women have babies. So what's so special about that? Well, it's the translation. The Hebrew can also mean a woman who's never known a man will give birth. That's miraculous. That's the miraculous. And of course, why would Isaiah even prophesy this? He's prophesying about the Messiah the whole time. You know, everything is in the future. Everything is miraculous. What he's going to do, the whole text is pointing towards the future, towards this person who's going to come. So the virgin birth, of course, is one of the things, probably the most denied part of, of Christ. Now, Jesus, it, it, or actually in Matthew, uh, Matthew 1, 18, 24, and 25, it says, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, Joseph, of course, so you got to understand how marriages were in Bible times. A man and a woman would be pledged to each other for a period of time. They wouldn't live together and have relations together, but they were intended to be married. In other words, Joseph was going to marry Mary at some time in the future, but they weren't living together. They weren't man and wife yet. Now, Islamic law does the same thing. Islam does the same thing. They take little girls, they pledge them to some man, and down the road they get married. That's an arranged marriage. That's kind of what the Hebrews did, you know. And Joseph was a righteous man. He followed the law, and when he found that Mary was with child, he was going to divorce her because he assumed that she had relations with somebody. And then, of course, he had a dream, and it said, don't worry, Joseph, this is of God, and so they stayed together. But Joseph, following the law, would have meant to divorce her. That would have been, you know, the right thing for him to do. And, of course, in the book of Luke, we have the famous visitation to Mary of the angel, Gabriel, who said that this all is going to happen. It says, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One 
to be born will be called the Son of God. So, Mary knew what was happening. Um, and again, people have said many things about the birth of Christ, that Mary had relations with a Roman soldier, that Mary, um, that Jesus was just another religious leader of the day. You know, you have to understand that um, there were a lot of people calling themselves the Christ in Bible times. You know, Jesus, if you look at it one way, was one of many. There were other people that were going around saying, I'm the Messiah, you know, and I'm fulfilling this prophecy and all that. And, and they would get a following and they would usually revolt against the Romans or try to, and the Romans would send in the troops and kill them all, throw them in jail, whatever. So Jesus was not the first person on the scene to say he was the Messiah. Uh, in fact, the Romans were pretty kind of ho-hum about it. The Jews got more upset about this than the Romans did. The Romans were kind of, okay, here's another one, you know. We'll send the troops out and we'll get rid of this one too. But Jesus was different because he didn't ask anybody to kick the Romans out, which is what the Jews wanted. They wanted a leader to get rid of the Romans and reestablish the kingdom uh, that they had known under David and Solomon. Jesus wouldn't do it. They tried to make him a king. He said, no, it's not time yet, even though he could have been the king. He was of the line of David. He could have been the king of Israel. But he didn't, he said, my kingdom isn't now. My kingdom's down the road. And so, again, the, uh, the Romans were used to this. And the virgin birth to them was just another thing that, you know, one of these weird ideas the Jews had, you know, about their Messiah. But uh, Jesus was, in fact, the fulfillment. If you look at all the prophecies about Christ and the Messiah, Jesus fulfills every one of them. Every one of them. They all apply to him, either his birth, his ministry, or his death and burial and resurrection. He's the only religious leader on the scene that ever did. And so the virgin birth is, it's essential. If Jesus was born just in the natural way, then he's just another teacher. He's just another good man. He's just another Gandhi, just another Buddha, just another good guy, you know, trying to make people better, uh, which is what the world wants. That's all they want. You know, they want Jesus to be equal with Muhammad and be equal with Joseph Smith and Buddha and, and you know, whatever little religious things are out there. They want us all to be equal so nobody's offended. We can't, we don't want to offend nobody. Oh, we can't offend nobody. Oh, that's so wrong. The worst sin in our society is offending. It is. It's offending somebody. You go to jail faster for that than anything. You offend somebody's, you know, sensibility, you're going to be in big trouble. And that's because our society's been reduced to the level where everything now is about your sexual orientation, your, uh, how much money you got in your pocket, your gender, or your race. That's it. Everything runs through those filters. And if you offend anything, if you, if you don't match up, then you're in trouble. You can't say what you want anymore. You can't preach what you want anymore. You cannot practice your faith anymore. It, you know, you're allowed to come to a place like this and have your little ceremony, 
jump around, do whatever we do, but don't take it outside. Oh no, don't take it out in the marketplace. Don't take it out in the street or school or work or, or wherever you're at. Nope, can't do that, that's offensive. And that's the worst thing now is to offend somebody. Even though everybody offends us, Christians can, they can be just stepped all over. They can be laughed at on TV, they can be taxed to death, they can have their churches burnt, yeah. kinds of stuff. Yeah. But, oh, we can't, you know, we can't offend anybody. So the virgin birth, again, is essential because if, it's, if he's just another guy that was born like me and you from his mother and his daddy, then he's just, just a man. And we all know, as Christians, that he's more than that. That he's God. Amen. He's God. We already got that part. And so the virgin birth, when you hear somebody discuss that, just remember that the Hebrew word has two ways of being translated. It's just like in the Old Testament when it said that David loved Jonathan. They were friends, okay? They weren't Lovers, the word can mean sexual love or it can mean friendship. And people take that to mean, oh, well, they were lovers, you know, and so it's okay and all that stuff. Well, that's not what it meant. It means that they were friends. When he was killed, he wept over him. So, you know, how you translate things does make a difference. Okay, we're gonna go just touch on the third point, and that's the bodily resurrection. Now we said before, back when Resurrection Sunday was here, which the world calls Easter, which is not what it is, Jesus didn't die on Easter, he died on Passover. He celebrated Passover. He didn't celebrate Easter, but at that time of the year, um, we celebrate the resurrection, the death, of course, but the resurrection is what's important to us because if Jesus was not resurrected, what did Paul say? Then you're still in your sins. If Jesus didn't come back and appear, then you and I don't have a Savior. We're just, uh, we're just lost. We might be good people. We might be better people today than we were five years ago because we came to church, but we're not forgiven. If Jesus didn't, res didn't come back, Paul said, we're all lost in our sins. Him too. He's just, he's, you know, when Paul got saved, he knew that he was just like everybody else. He wasn't, he wasn't a Pharisee anymore. He was, he was humbled. He'd been a leader. He was humbled. He had to start all over. Paul didn't go out and run out and start ministering. You read the New Testament. He was in the desert for three years. Being taught by who? Jesus. Directly. Just like Moses up on the mountain. There was no Bible then. Moses was up there getting direct revelation from God about building the temple and the law. All that was, you know... God, you know, talking to him directly. Same with Paul. He didn't hop out and start running around preaching anything. He was in the desert, you know, learning who Jesus was and who God was. You have to remember that in our world, the church of the New Testament was a failure by our modern standards. Jesus got killed, Paul got run out of town, uh, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, thrown in jail, all the apostles were killed. By our modern standards, the early church was their failure. They didn't do nothing. We didn't have big ministry. They didn't have 5,000 people in their service and a mailing list and, you know, tapes and, and, and all that stuff. By our modern standards, Jesus and the apostles were failures. So think about that. Think about that. What are we really supporting today? Some guy gets on TV, 
do we really listen to what's being preached? Or are we, and I have to say this, as Pentecostal, full gospel people, we like to praise, we like to worship, we like to run, we like to, but you know what? There's more than that. There's more to it. You can do all that and walk out of this building and still be lost. I'm just going to close with that. I'll stop right there. I'm just going to say it that way because there's no other way to say it. You can do all this stuff and still be lost. Just look at Judas. Judas did everything the apostles did and he was lost. The prodigal. Anybody remember the parable of the prodigal son? Yes. He went and all God had given him all this stuff, you know. And he went away from God and he went away from every precious thing that he had. And he went out and he lived with the piggers. And he wallowed around in the slop and he had nothing. Now, everybody says that the prodigal son that says uh, he ate with the pigs. He didn't eat with the pigs. He says he wish he could eat with the pigs. They wouldn't give him none. What a job where they don't pay you at all. You slop the hogs and don't pay you at all. What they were eating was the little beans off the locust tree, them just the little beans, that's what it was. The husk. And then he came to himself. This whole nation needs a coming to itself Amen. to realize that God is God and the, the lights to come on and people to be changed. Amen. See, the prodigal, Amen. he would just find, I'm okay, I just live happy, have a great time, until he came to himself. Amen. And we need to pray for people to come to themselves for that piercing, Acts 2.36, the piercing of the heart, that all of a sudden that they might come to themselves and know that they are sinners. Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 319-828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204. Oxford, Iowa, 52322, or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org. This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa.